What's going on folks? My name is Ethan Moore and today we're going to be diving in to the exoplanets. Exoplanets are really cool and um, I really wanted to do a video series on all of them because there's, uh, there's this software right now called NASA's Eyes on Exoplanets and um, it's completely free, completely open source and uh, it is a massive database of all of the exoplanets that we know of. And I think that's super neat because a lot of people don't realize how many exoplanets there really are out there and um, that every single day uh, we, we constantly search for them and we've found a lot. Uh, I mean, compared to, we, we find about one a week. That might be going up, but, um, that might be more in the next uh, 10 years. Uh, so we found we found a lot of these exoplanets and um, there's a couple that are pretty notable like uh, Kepler here. Um, and there's a couple that aren't like Tau Ceti um, that I'm gonna be covering in, in different videos. However, nonetheless, I wanted to start off on a pretty popular one. And uh, Kepler 22 is a pretty popular one to say the least. Kepler-22 actually isn't an exoplanet in itself. Kepler-22 is a G-type star. And so you're asking yourself, what does that mean? Well, a G-type star is a star that's about, it's it's 3% less massive than our sun. And uh, Kepler-22 here is about 2% smaller in volume and 3% less massive than our sun. So it fits that category of a G-type star. Um, its surface temperature is about 5200 degrees Celsius or 5500 degrees Kelvin compared with the Sun, our Sun, which has a surface temperature of 5500 degrees Celsius and 5700 degrees Kelvin. It's a little dimmer, a little cooler, and uh, Kepler 22b is about 4 billion years old, which in comparison to our sun, uh, which is about 6.4 billion years old, Kepler 22b is a little younger, which makes sense why it is cooler and slightly smaller. So we have known about Kepler 22 for quite a number of years now. Um, as I'm recording, it is 2020. Uh, however, Kepler-22 and Kepler-22b, the planet we're going to be looking at here, were first discovered in 2009. Now, the apparent magnitude of Kepler-22 is 11.5. This basically means it's too dim to be seen with the naked eye. But that's okay. You will notice it's named Kepler, and they have letters. And this exoplanet specifically is named Kepler-22b. So that indicates something. That indicates it was found by the Kepler Space Telescope, and this is why and how we were able to observe it. Kepler-22b um, and a lot of other exoplanets are found uh, in, in a very weird way. See, basically what happens is the Kepler Space Telescope, as it was going to discover Kepler-22b, it took its lens and it pointed its lens towards Kepler, uh, Kepler-22, the, the sun here in this system, the star in the system. Wow. <laughs> I've got to get my terminology right here. Um, nonetheless, uh, the Kepler Space Telescope pointed directly at Kepler-22, and it noticed a little black dot pass over, and that was in 2009. And at that point, they said, yes, this is the first transit of Kepler-22b, and that is when it was first observed. It was then observed again in March of 2010 by Switzer, and again by Kepler in December of 2010. And then they observed a 7.4 hour transit by the Spitzer Space Telescope, confirming officially that yes, Kepler 22b was in fact a planet. Now, 
habitability is what Kepler 22b is known for. It's made a couple of popular appearances in media, and most of the time it's set as the planet that is potentially habitable and could harbor some sort of life. In fact, it was featured in two books and one TV show. Um, that TV show is named uh, Raised by Wolves, if you've, if you've ever heard of it. I, I hadn't heard of it until reading about it on the, on the Kepler 22B Wikipedia, um, but it was also featured in two books. And it's um, an exoplanet that is sometimes highlighted by exoplanet documentaries, so you may have heard of it from there too. But um, yeah, it's about 620 light years from Earth, as you can see over here. Um, and it's a potentially rocky world larger than Earth. Keep that larger in Earth in mind because it is considered a super Earth or an Earth or a potentially habitable. It's, in a, it's close to a potentially habitable zone and uh, it is bigger than Earth. Um, or, uh, nonetheless, <laughs> uh, the definition of super earth is right here again, a, p a possible ocean world orbiting in the habitable zone, um, which sounds really cool. <laughs> um, so, uh, you can see right here, it points out that it's an artist concept, just like the first animation, um, of the planet we had there. We don't actually know what Kepler-22b looks like, and uh, it won't be for some time that we're uh, able to figure out what Kepler-22b really looks like. Um, it's 620 light years away from from Earth, so it's it's kind of it's kind of hard to send a space probe over there to take a photo of it, <laughs> but. Um, it's got some pretty cool characteristics, and one of the things I love about the NASA's Eyes on the Exoplanets website here is it gives us a lot of cool data, so I got a, I got a call on my phone that slightly interrupted me. However, let's dive into some of the data within Kepler-22b. So we can see here its mass is about 36 Earths, so it is significantly bigger than Earth. Um, 2.38 times uh, Earth, and uh, it's got an orbital radius of 0 0.849. It's got an orbital period of 289.9 days. Uh, you could round that out to 290 days. Um, and it doesn't have any orbital eccentricity. Um, and then you can see here the star comparison, Kepler-22b and our sun are very, very similar. Um, it's a little younger. Uh, our, our sun is a little older. Kepler-22 is a little younger. But um, uh, that, as I mentioned earlier, um, but this is the real yeah, infographic I really like. <laughs> so um, I used to read about all of these far-flung stars, Alpha Centauri, uh, different deep sky objects like Andromeda and wonder how long would it take to get there and um, NASA's eyes of the exoplanet they, they really really incorporate some great infographics here um, and they they allow us to to do the calculation so at 60 miles per hour it would take 7 billion years to get there by jet it would take 693 million years to get there course uh, a jet probably couldn't get into orbit so that wouldn't be the way to do it however a space probe would be one of the more likely means of getting there uh, and Voyager of course is traveling at 38,000 miles per hour now Voyager travels that speed because it's had a, a couple of gravity assists it um, also is uh, the furthest object outside of our solar system um, and it would take 11 million years to get there still so it's going to be quite a while before we go and uh, send a probe to Kepler 22b or take photos however with that being said um, it's definitely a really really cool planet and if we're ever able to travel at the speed of light 
it would only take 620 years. So, <laughs> still quite some time. Um, they Here's the a great little picture of the Kepler Space Telescope. And so you can see it's pointed out uh, towards a massive sun there. I don't know which sun that is, but um, I'm a little concerned. It's really, really close to Kepler. <laughs> um, I don't think our sun is that big, uh, but I've never been in space. Maybe maybe the sun does look that big in, in space. Um, but nonetheless, uh, here's Kepler 22b. It's infamous. It's really cool. And it is in really close to the habitable zone. So does it contain life? Well, it has an ocean, and this is one of the prime factors in looking for planets that contain life. And the reason that is, is we think life on Earth was started because of our ocean. We also know that oceans do a really good job at clearing out gross, bad chemicals that prevent life from occurring. So, if it is as habitable as we think, there's a very good chance there could be life on it somewhere. Nonetheless, this is the first episode of Exoplanets. I hope you enjoyed. Um, I'm going to be talking about some less notable exoplanets in the future. And uh, I'm sorry about that interruption earlier. Nonetheless, I hope you enjoyed. If you like the series, subscribe to my channel. Um, it means the world. And if you have a comment or you think I missed something, let me know down below. The only way I improve is with peer review. So thank you so much. We'll talk soon and bye for now.